Welcome to UNU. We're very lucky to have today with us Professor Sir Lawrence Friedman, who's visiting Tokyo and has been kind enough to come and spend an evening here at UNU. And for those who can't be with us in person, uh, he's agreed to spend a little while uh, on video so that we can be with you online. Uh, Professor Friedman has published a magnificent book recently. I hold it up sideways so you can see it's no small matter. A strategy, a history. It's a, it's a wonderful book. And that's what we'll be discussing later in the day with uh, a public audience here in Tokyo. So Lawrence, if I may, can I ask you uh, how uh, you approach the subject? You have a wonderful line at the very beginning of the book by the boxer Tyson, that everybody has a plan until they're punched in the face. So uh, that tends to suggest that uh, strategy doesn't always work if it's strategy of the wrong sort. Yeah, I mean, the, the, the basic uh, theme, I suppose, that comes through the book is that people who have ambitious and elaborate strategies that take them to some distant goal well into the future and involve lots of different steps that uh, lots of different uh, people have got to comply with if you're going to get to that goal, they tend to be a disappointment. Yeah. That, that, that they tend not to be successful. And Tyson put it pithily, uh, <laughs> von Moltke's famous line was that no plan survives contact with the enemy. doesn't mean to say you shouldn't plan, sometimes plans work, but that it does mean that, you, that strategy should really start with uh, a problem, the, the problem that, that you've uh, at hand, uh, and move along from there with some destination in mind. But basically, it's about the here and now rather than the, a distant goal. Yes, yeah, so having uh, an objective in a way and then being open to adapting uh, en route. When I lived in India, I was very struck by the fact that uh, American geostrategists, people from the Rand Corporation elsewhere, terrific people by and large, would come through and be just tremendously irritated with their Indian counterparts because the Americans would say, but you have no strategy, by which they meant you don't agree with our strategy or you're not participating in it. And the Indians would allow us to how, yes, they weren't very interested in the American strategy. And if pressed very hard, they would articulate a goal of strategic autonomy, they, mm. they called it, uh, which was essentially keeping everybody else at bay. Um, the, the strategy biz is quite a large biz, particularly mm. in the United States. And indeed, you have a section in the book on the, the business dimension yeah. of strategy, which I found very interesting. Well, I mean, one of the things I always wanted to do in this book, and it's been a long time in gestation, was uh, to look at all different sorts of strategy, uh, because having played a role in sort of management of my university uh, and got interested anyway in, in, in business organization, uh, it struck me for a long time that most books on strategy these days are not written by people on the military sphere, they're written by people on the business sphere. And it was a particularly American thing that, that you had consultancies that offered strategies as a product that, that could be yes. sold um, with formulas that could be applied and offering you success. And <laughs> this is the latest thing. <laughs> and uh, indeed, when I was doing the book, one of the things that I was pleased to discover is there is now uh, an academic literature on fads and fashions um, th th that follows and traces some of the ideas produced by these consultancies and watch as they rise and then fall again as again they prove to be a disappointment. Mm -hmm. So um, part of part of it is not, not to debunk it because it's some really very interesting thinking, uh, some good thinking that, that, that goes on under this heading, uh, but there is a particular sort I suppose associated with the gurus, going back to India, um, the uh, um, people who, who give very fancy seminars and high priced and offer these formulas and the, and the new way of doing things, which often has a very short half-life in practice. Yes, and, and consultancies, it seems to me, are always 
prepared when their strategy isn't working. They have another strategy in the drawer which will work better. And that, in a way, is very contrary to the type of strategy that you write about, in a sense, uh, because the longer view tends to be absent. It's sold as something that will produce good results in the long run, but it can be exchanged quite readily for something else. Uh, I think part of the problem is, I mean, a lot, a lot of what we think of as strategy, I argue towards the end of the book, mm. is quite intuitive and we might call it common sense or judgment. I think, yes. you know, judgment is a pretty good guide to, to, to how to operate. If you've been around long enough, you've got experience, you can recognize a situation, something tells you that's the best way to move and so on. And then you may articulate it and that's when it starts to take a strategic form. Um, but sort of elaborate planning processes tend to actu actually take you away from judgment because um, they they like quantified do yeah. data, um, they like everybody with particular tasks that they must fulfill, um, and the experience of them, particularly when you know, there's a really big vogue uh, in both government and corporations for planning in the 50s and 60s, uh, is that they didn't work because actually they detached the people who were responsible from the process that was generating these plans and ideas and strategies. Um, and so you lost, um, you, you, you lost the chance to put that common sense uh, aspect to it and say, well, this doesn't sound right to me, this isn't working, or it's not, it's not producing the right answers, or the data upon which it's working is corrupted at some point. But the trouble was that for this, the people who were doing the planning, they said, well, it's, people aren't performing their tasks properly. Mm. Uh, yeah, you know, <laughs> it's it, not it, our fault. It's not our fault. They're not implementing <laughs> the plan as it should be implemented. And therefore, the, the answer was to you know, better discipline in the organization. So it became actually an instrument of centralized control yes. rather than uh, decentralized decision making. But that is often anyway very, uh, in my experience, uh, very consonant with consultancy approaches that people should do exactly what we tell them to do and uh, otherwise we can't guarantee success but of course success can't be guaranteed anyway. Success can't be guaranteed. I mean my view is, is that um, you need a good diagnosis yeah. of your problems, um, that I think it's reasonable that the uh, chief executives do have to lead, they do have to make, they are responsible and accountable. But actually what you need is, is an adaptive system yes. of some sort, that, that, that when things aren't working, you need early notice of that and not that you're not doing your job properly, you're not meeting your targets, but this is telling us there's a problem mm. and, and therefore we need to look again. So you know, my approach is flexible, adapt, adaptive, pragmatic, um, and so on. Again, not without some framework. You do need some framework to, to take you forward. But it, 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 as soon as you move into a rigid control and a definite plan, you're asking for trouble. Now, to your university, King's College London, mm -hmm. and your department, which has had an extraordinary run, I think, over the last 25, 30 years, uh, the Department of War Studies. Peace studies are very fashionable nowadays, and you don't run into many departments of war studies. No. Yours actually spans, it seems to be, from war to peace. Indeed. Uh, and so I wanted to ask you about the diversity you've built in with colleagues into that department. Well, I think, um, I mean, I put it down to, uh, since the man who founded the department, who's still going strong in his early 90s now, uh, Sir Michael Howard. Oh, of course. Uh, yes. Who, uh, although a historian, a very good historian, was very open to different methodologies and approaches. Um, so he created first an interdisciplinary department, very few people to start with, um, that uh, because you're dealing with war, um, took a dispassionate approach, not to say disengaged, but dispassionate, mm. that, that you you had, be, simply because of the horrors which you're often having to, to address, you had to use uh, analysis as best you could um, to think it through. And that was influenced actually by his mentor, Basil Little Hart. Um, and that because you're in the middle of London, you also have to stay engaged with policy makers and the media, and so because you can do it in the middle of London. Um, 
but it, what it wasn't, obviously, was militarist. I mean, it wasn't saying that, you know, that, that we need wars or mongering wars. Mm. That wasn't the point. Uh, and, you know, if ever anybody suggests that, I say, we've got a backlog. We don't need any more. Uh, there's plenty of wars around. Peace studies, I think, which um, the main department was and still is in, in Bradford in, in the UK, yes. um, I think, which was set up by Quakers, I think they were arguing that academic study should be improving and produce peace. Yes. I think we, we were more pluralist and diverse. Um, but as things have turned out, the, the department now covers everything from prevention of war, conflict resolution, uh, coping with the aftermath, uh, as well as um, how wars are actually fought. And, you know, at some point, it's not, it seems to me, inappropriate to ask if there are better ways of fighting wars uh, than some of those that are adopted, because those are the choices that policymakers sometimes find that they're facing. Probably on the minds of many people coming to your talk this evening uh, would be, would you have any practical advice from a strategy perspective for either President Putin or those opposing him in the West over the Ukraine on how to get to a better outcome than we're at at the moment? Yes, I mean, I, I've been following Ukraine very closely and... Uh, it's quite interesting because Putin has been presented as some sort of brilliant strategist that has uh, kept the West on the back foot and taken the initiative. And certainly he's the one who's, who's taken every initiative. But I think he's a lousy strategist because um, although he's certainly damaged Ukraine and inhibits its, uh, its future, he's done enormous damage to Russia in the process. And I think we'll end up with a very messy outcome as far as uh, Russia's original objectives in Ukraine. I think it's been quite an impulsive sort of strategy. And one of the interesting things about it is that um, it's based on a series of quite fictional propositions about what happened in Ukraine, um, about the amount of support there is in eastern Ukraine for the Russian uh, position, about things like the uh, Malaysian airliner and so on. Uh, about the degree of Russian military involvement in eastern Ukraine. And once you're sort of fighting this sort of information battle, propaganda battle, which mm. is what we used to have called it in the past, um, you get caught, you get trapped by your own propaganda. So Putin um, is, in a sense, arguing for a ceasefire, but then saying, but, you know, you can't deal with me because I have no involvement in this, but everybody knows that's not true. And therefore actually creates more and more problems for, for himself. And, you know, meanwhile, the Russian economy is getting into deeper and deeper trouble. So uh, I don't think he's been a brilliant strategist. It's very difficult, I think, for a Western response because Ukraine is not an ally. Yes. Uh, it's not a member of NATO. Um, so... You can respond to the violation of international norms, to the aggression, to the um, annexation of land, which uh, uh, is not yours, or whatever you may think historically. And no doubt, I mean, there's obviously a strong Russian case historically, but the matter of fact was Ukrainian. Um, so you can respond to that, but it's not an Article 5 question yes. in terms of the um, NATO Mutual uh, treaty. defense. Uh, no, the, the, the attack on one is an attack on all. So um, I think the Allies don't want Putin to win in Ukraine, um, but they've had to rely on economic coercion as their main effort and are dependent on how the Ukrainians handle it themselves. Uh, and uh, you know, there the are obvious limits to what they can do uh, against a reasonably well-prepared Russian troops. They did perfectly well against the separatists supported by Russian weapons and some special forces, but they, they struggled against Russian troops. Um, so in the end, you, all you can do is support the government of Ukraine. The government of Ukraine is clearly quite divided itself now on uh, between a peace party and a war party as to how it, it handles Russia. So um, I think this has been an example of, of poor strategy from Putin. And actually, it's quite hard to, um, I've always said, it's, it's very hard 
in international affairs to deal with somebody who's being stupid. Um, a lot of the problems of getting caught out by surprise and tap because people are doing something that in some way, basic level, is irrational. Mm. Um, and it unnerves the decision making because you want to think that you can calculate the moves of the other side. But in Putin's case, it's quite strong and he's, it's quite difficult. And he's played on that. Um, by you know, a sense of menace and intimidation and referring to Russia as a nuclear power or take us a couple of days to get to Kiev or, or whatever. Um, so I think that that's hampered the, uh, the NATO response. I don't actually think it's been that bad. I mean, I know a lot of people think it's been quite weak, but actually, uh, if you look at it in the round, given the starting expectations, it hasn't been that bad. Whether it's good enough, we'll see. Mm. Lawrence, thank you very much for being with us. These are the sorts of issues we'll be discussing later today. But for those joining us online, it's been a treat. Thank you. My pleasure.